Hi, ladies. Would you join with us in worshiping the Lord today?
Lord, you are so holy and so mighty. And the Trinity, we can't do anything in this life without you, God. With God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, how you minister to us and make ways for us to be able to serve you through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of your word, you speak to us. God, we worship you. We're in awe of your majesty. You sit on the throne as God the Father, but then God the Son came in the flesh so that God could be with us. Thank you. We're in awe of you, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back, ladies, to Study and Share. My name is Carson King, and I'm very excited to be with you today. I'm so excited about this study that we're doing on everyday theology, because what you believe really matters. This week, we're going to focus on some key truths about God. That word truth is so important about what it is and where to find it. Last week, Beth had talked about scripture and how scripture is inerrant. It's consistent and it's reliable. It can be trusted. We have all of these external sources that are showing us that the Bible is true and can be trusted. In this society where we have an overload of information right now, it's important now more than ever to be able to recognize truth and to be able to see it for what it is and to be able to have that foundation to go back to. When we study the word of God and we have scripture as our foundation, we are able to walk forward in the world with surety and assurance. I was raised in the church and my parents put me in this program called Bible Bowl. And it's a little bit dorky, but it's kind of like a quiz team or mathletes for the Bible where you spend time studying script and memorizing scripture. And then with your team, you actually go around the state or even the country quizzing on those verses of the Bible. It was so important in my childhood to have this foundation of memorizing scripture and hiding it in my heart. Because by doing that, I was able to learn about God and learn how to interact with God. But it's so important to remember that knowing about God is completely different than knowing God. It's not just head knowledge, ladies. It's so important to apply the truth of scripture and to enter into the relationship with God because our God is a relational God. And we're gonna explore that more in this lesson. So our book on page 37 goes into two words. And this is that head knowledge, yes, but it's important to have knowledge. So polytheism is the worship of many gods. And henotheism is the worship of one God, but the belief in many gods. However, what makes Christianity different and distinct from other religions in the world is the idea of monotheism. And that's the worship and belief that there is one and only one God. This is the distinctiveness and delight of Christianity. If you notice, the word God is repeated three times on this slide. However, the Christianity monotheism has God with a capital G. The difference of this big G versus a little G is the idea that God is supreme. He's sovereign and reigning over everything. Nothing takes him by surprise and he is in complete control. It's so important to understand who God is and who he says he is in his word. So going to his word, in Deuteronomy 4.39, he says, Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above 
and on the earth below. There is no other. So what God are you serving? Do you believe all these little gods or are you serving the God of self, the God of money, the God of passion or the God of the world? There is only one God with a capital G. In Nehemiah 9, 6, he writes, you alone are the Lord. You created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all things and the host of heaven worships you. Scripture proclaims the radiance of God and who he is. He is a person. He is more than just an idea or a concept. And he is alive. Just because I use the word that he is a person, I want to take a step back and make sure we understand that we are trying to understand an infinite God with our very finite minds. So the next part that of God that we're going to be going into is a little bit challenging to wrap your head around and it's okay if you don't fully understand it because the idea of the Trinity means three in one and that's the idea that God manifests in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is not saying that God is three separate gods or that this is three different views of one God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity, and the w- book goes into the fact that the, tr- the word Trinity actually does not show up in Scripture. However, it's an idea that we have taken and created as part of understanding who God is and it is backed in scripture by having all of scripture as a whole to support it. So understanding that you have to base everything back to scripture and truth. Each person of the Trinity is co-equal, meaning there's no hierarchy. They are relationally distinct, but they are still one God. And God is eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, and unchanging. Each one of these things are found in Scripture. Over time, people have tried to create analogies to help better understand this concept or idea of the Trinity. They've used the analogy of a three-leaf clover, where you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But the reality is that analogies can help clarify and bring understanding, but they will always break down, which is why it's so important to make sure we are understanding Scripture in light of itself. The clover analogy breaks down because no one would say that one leaf is the whole clover. Whereas in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each person of the Trinity is fully and completely God. There's been an analogy of an egg or an avocado as the parts of a whole. However, again, each person is fully God. It's not a three-way division of him. There's also been expressed the analogy of water and its different states of matter. Water goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas, but this is just one element acting in three different forms. God isn't one person switching between forms, but three persons in one. Again, it's okay if this is hard to understand or wrap our head around the idea of the Trinity. God gives us grace to understand and know him. In knowing who he is, we look at God the Father. Each person of the Trinity is distinct in their roles. His primary role is in creation and final judgment. But because they are co-equal, they work with the, the Son and the Spirit to do so. 
Genesis 1 tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So we can see God the Father created. And we see the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We see two parts of the Trinity here in creation. However, you have to look a little bit deeper to see the sun. I said it earlier, we use scripture to interpret scripture and we have to understand it in its greater context because scripture is 100% true. You can go from one part to another to use them as context. In 1 John 1, he writes, and he's writing about Jesus, in the beginning was the word. We'll go a little bit more in depth with this in the lesson on Jesus, but Jesus is often referred to as the word of God. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. They all existed at the beginning and helped with creation. So we see that God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and He was light. Now in this verse, when God says, let there be light, He was creating the light that we know it as the sun and light versus dark. But in the previous verse, we also saw that Jesus is the light of men. Jesus, the Son of God, His primary role is in our salvation. But He works with the Father and the Spirit to do so. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God is perfect, and that means he's just. He can't be unfair. It's outside of his nature, which means as sinful humans, we have a problem that needed to be dealt with. We made a choice at the beginning of creation when he created us, broke the relationship we had with him. He can't just overlook our sins. But he sent the son as plan A, not plan B, to offer the opportunity and the chance of salvation, to fulfill the payment for our crime. In 1 John, he writes about Jesus. In him, you also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is working with the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Father in this act of salvation. God sent the Son, and then Jesus sent the Holy Spirit as proof of our salvation and a seal to keep us safe. It's a promise that God intends to fulfill. God the Spirit, his primary role is in sanctification, which that's a word that can tend to become a little bit Christianese or religiosity. Sanctification just means the transformation of our hearts, minds, and life to look more like a reflection of Jesus Christ himself. And this is not a work that we do. It is a work that is done inside of us the more we engage with God and who he is and who he says he is. The Holy Spirit works with the Father and the Son to bring about this transformation. In Ezekiel, God makes a promise and one that's fulfilled quickly of, and I will give you a new heart 
and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The father gives the spirit to guide and teach us. He's our helper, but he's still a full part of God, a full person of God. And he is inside of us when we accept Jesus. John also writes, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And this is Jesus talking. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit is the one that is inside of us, convicting us of which way to walk, right and wrong. And he directs us back to scripture to see God's truth. All of these different parts of the Trinity are still one whole, because God is holy, And he is different and distinct from all else. In our book, it talks about that holiness is a single word that sums up all of God's perfection and superiority. God is perfect and unchanging, and he's consistent. We have the angels who sing constantly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. A holy God doesn't change. Sometimes that's hard to understand because humans are constantly changing. And the whole point of our transformation is change. So a lot of people, when they read scripture, have a hard time reconciling the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New. In the Old Testament, it seems like God is very wrathful and angry. He's constantly looking down on us and disappointed in us. And the New Testament, it could be said that God is all love and happiness and rainbows. And that seems to become a sticking point for a lot of people. However, it's not two separate gods or a God who changed. It's one story. And it's a consistent story. The people in the Old Testament, God was setting the stage for Jesus to come in the new. The Old Testament was based on covenantal laws that you had to obey, those rules, because God wanted us to understand the weight of our sins. And then Jesus showed up at the fullness of time to die once and for all, for all sins. Romans 5, 8 tells us that, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sends his son at the fullness of time, even though Jesus shows up in the flesh, in the middle of what looks like the story, he's been present from the beginning because he was in creation and he was part of creation. This is not a story about us living up to a standard or living rightly. This is a story about a God who loves us and in his love, he chose to create. He chose to create us to glorify himself. It's a little bit hard to think about sometimes that someone would choose to create you to glorify him. Because we have the mindset of it's all about us. But the reality is it's all about God. And God wants to create a transformation in each one of us because it brings glory to him. It begs the question, why do we need to change? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God is perfect and love is made perfect in God and love is a choice and in his perfect love God chose to create us even knowing we would sin 
He doesn't need us. He didn't need us to satisfy a desire that he had or a lack that he had. No, God chose in his love to create us because he wanted a relationship with us. God is an intimate God who desires to walk with each one of us. God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. What a profound idea to be able to walk with God. And yet, when man had the greatest love, he chose to sin. And he walked away from that love. And so, in that choice that Adam made, sin entered into the world. Genesis 5, 3 tells us, When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The image of God was still present, but it had been muddied by the result of our choice. However, God is faithful and God is a promise keeper. He set the stage knowing that we would sin. And he promised a Messiah that would come at the fullness of time and create a change within us. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. Next week, we're going to go into God is a faithful promise keeper and that God is a good father. So for your silent reflection, and you can pause the video for this, how are you currently investing in your relationship with God and allowing it to transform you? If you don't have one currently, do you need to come to him with a repentant heart and accept the love he is freely offering? You can pause the video to reflect on this. And for your prayer prompt, pray that each woman might be transformed by the truth of God and his love and might grow deeper in relationship with him as a person. For your small group discussion questions, what does a changed life because of your relationship with God look like in the day to day? What are some misconceptions you have or may still have about God that become hiccups in your relationship with him? And why is it so important to define him through his words and not our own perceptions? If you need additional questions, you can see page 60 in your book. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word and for who you are. I thank you that you are a relational God, that you seek us out and you pursue us. Father, I just ask that each and every woman watching today would be transformed by the knowledge of your love and who you are. I pray, Father, that you would go before this world and that you would eliminate the spirit of fear which has become so pervasive. Father, I just ask that you would put a thirst in each and everyone's hearts for your word and for a, a deeper relationship with you. And we thank you for your son, whom you sent to offer us salvation because we broke your heart. Father, I thank you that you love us and desire 
our good for your glory. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, ladies.